Welcome, Laura Gilbert. Thanks for joining us. This is our series of teacher spotlight interviews uh, where we highlight the work that teachers are doing out there. Um, so we're going to talk to you today. Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into flute from the beginning and how that led to teaching and your career. Okay. Well, I grew up in New York City. And I was lucky enough from the time that I was really little to go to the Young People's Concerts at the Philharmonic. And um, Julius Baker was the first flute player. And I started playing flute when I was, I don't know, maybe 11 years old or something. And from that moment on, you know, I'd go to the Philharmonic and just zero right in on the flute section. and. Um, you know, I just always loved playing. I also used to dance. And so, and I grew up doing um, Dalcros, which is a really amazing combination of moving, of using your body and music. It's very integrating mm -hmm. um, of all the different like facets of feeling music and moving to music. And um, anyway, so, um, I was also lucky enough because I was in New York City to be able to start my flute studies um, with Samuel Barron, who just lived four blocks away from me. And so, you know, my parents used to walk me over there and I would go into his teaching studio and he had two kids who were just a little bit younger than me. And they would be like hiding out under the tables, under the furniture and the piano in the room while I was playing. And it was all very like warm and friendly and just kind of, I was just lucky because there was no boundary between like going for a flute lesson and playing music and just being around warmth and friendliness and love of music. And so that's kind of always how I felt about music. And so I didn't really know what I was gonna do. And it wasn't until I was actually at college at Sarah Lawrence College that I decided that I really wanted to play the flute. And so then I auditioned all over the place and um, I really wanted to leave New York City. And so I ended up going to New England, New England Conservatory. And then I ended up after a few years of living in Boston and really enjoying it, um, but actually studying with Julius Baker, who they were flying up to teach, deciding that I really wanted to be back in New York. So I transferred to Juilliard and then I spent a bunch of years at Juilliard getting my bachelor's and my master's. Um, and then I went to Stony Brook and got my doctorate there. And um, so I would say that my biggest influences uh, as teachers and mentors were probably Sam Barron because he was just the music man yeah. Everything he did was just music. And Julie Baker was just, you know, he would just pick up his flute and he would say, play it like this. And then he would play it and it just, you couldn't even believe how great it sounded. And he couldn't really articulate why it sounded that way, how he did it. But you just kind of got it, you know, went into your bones and everything. Mm -hmm. And I worked a lot with Tom Neifinger and, um, and then Paula Robeson was just always this kind of shining star of an inspiration. Um, and, you know, I would say that what all those people, well, Tom and Sam and Paula all had in common was just like they played and they shared. And so there was just no difference really between what they were doing as performers and what they were doing as teachers. And I mean, the two things were so intertwined. They were so wrapped around each other. And um, that's kind of how what I learned, you know, that there's no separation. And, you know, Tom Neifinger would get like, he would just get all lit up when he would be showing you something and how to do it. And then like he would start doing it, you know, and then you could tell that he was that that he was learning as much as we were, as he would go through and discuss something and illustrate it and everything. Um, you know, it just always seemed to me that the people I worked with, their teaching was part of their process of playing. And, um, and I think that that's uh, 
what was always in my mind, that I wouldn't really be a complete musician without the ability to articulate in some way what I was doing and why it was important and why other people should do it. And without the words and the sharing and the bringing other people along, being a flutist and playing concerts, it just isn't worth the same, yeah. you know? It's, you need both together, yeah. you know? And, and so, um, you know, then I spent a number of summers at Marlboro and at Marlboro, you know, you're playing with people like, I don't know, I, I played a concert with Rudolf Serkin when he, you know, just a, a year before he passed away. I mean, I had to help him stand up at the end wow. of rehearsal, you know, but there was still just like this joy for not only playing, but sharing, teaching, you know, sitting mm -hmm. down together and, and like he would just share his ideas and that was what kept him going. It wasn't just playing another Haydn trio or Schubert again. Yeah. It was the fact that he was, you know, giving it to somebody. And so it became just a natural course of events that I started teaching a lot. What was your first teaching gig? Was it just some private students or was it at a school or organization? Well, I, I started doing my doctorate at Stony Brook mm -hmm. and um, right as I started, I had the fellowship there to be Sam Barron's assistant, um, but that was right when his health started failing. And so from the time I started there for the next three years of sort of residing there, commuting there to teach and take classes, um, he was in and out of the hospital. And so I was doing a lot of teaching for him. It was sort of initiation by fire. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason I wanted to go there was because I wanted to get some Kind of pedagogical background and you know work with him at the end of my studies as well as at the beginning um but i ended up actually just kind of figuring it out as i went along because all of a sudden i just had all these students who i was teaching yeah. um yeah and then from there i um, started teaching at city college at queen's college at hunter um and then Oh my goodness, at Purchase. And then I, for um, 11 years, I taught at Herod Conservatory Lynn University. That was right before I had my children. Um, and I've just, ever since then, always taught. What are you doing, are you doing now? Are you teaching at, a, at any school still? You're on um, faculty at some school still, right? Yes, so I teach, I teach at Manus mm -hmm. and I have, um, a ton of prep students there who are just really amazing. Yeah. And I have a, a bunch of students who um, come just come to me from all over at different ages. And then I have this job that I've had for a really long time, which I really cherish at St. Anne's School, which is this amazing um, Latin progressive arts school in Brooklyn Heights. And we have this huge chamber music program there. So I have a job coaching chamber music, running a Bach ensemble. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and then I have a bunch of private students who um, are there. And I always have a few who go on to conservatory. Um, although I always tell them, you know, you don't have to do this now. <laughs> you could go to a, a wonderful liberal arts school and keep playing and, and figure it out. But, you know, mm -hmm. if you have your, if you have fire in the belly, there's, not much can be done about that. Yeah. Um, do you, I mean, you teach all different levels of students. Do you have like a certain age group that you enjoy the most? You know, I love when a really talented, unformed, open player comes to me. So, you know, I don't, there are all kinds of different ages when that can happen. It's really surprising. Um, but I love being able to work with somebody who has the openness of spirit and the intelligence and capacity to just take in what I'm saying so that we can have a real dialogue. Um, so I'm, 
you know, I love working, like I have a lot of students come to me when they're getting ready to take um, orchestra auditions or audition for like graduate programs and stuff like that or teaching jobs. Um, and, you know, I love that work too. Um, but, you know, for the most part, when you're working with people who are at that level, um, even if you see 10 things that you wish they would do differently or that you might be able to help them with, you have to be really mindful of the fact that they're developing their own voice and that probably the most important thing that they can do when they go in for those auditions is be able to revel in who they are and what they're doing at their strongest. Right. And so that kind of work for me always feels very rewarding on one level because they're really uncovering who they are with my help. But on the other level, I just want to get in there and, you know, play in the mud. <laughs> I just really want to, you know, I want to play around and see what I can do to help them. And, you know, it's so clear, like if you just angled the air a little bit more that way, your sound would be twice as big. Yeah. You know, or if you didn't lift your head way up in the air when you were trying to play high notes, it, things would just be so much more in tune and clearer and, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. Great. Um, you mentioned Del Crows earlier. Do you still use that in your teaching now? Well, I don't use it per se, mm -hmm. but I do. I mean, I think that the most, the best instrumental playing on any instrument, voice, anything, is playing where your your whole self is aligned. You know, you can't just be a flutist from your torso up, holding the flute and breathing. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I talk a lot about um, balance, about, you know, feeling the ground underneath you and feeling yourself sort of like, you know, like a tree, you know, you're just, you have these roots and then you just, everything just opens up from those roots, you know, and if the roots are strong and solid, but flexible, then the wind can take you in any direction and, and you're there, everything is intact. Yeah, um, I love that. Does that come from, did you do any sort of like Alexander technique? Um, um, I've done a little bit of Alexander mm -hmm. technique, but not a lot really. Okay. You know, I, I went to School of American Ballet for many years when I was a kid. So, um, you know, like I said, I'm just very sort of physically focused on yeah. that stuff. But no, not too much Alexander technique. Um, you know, Keith Underwood, who's one of my heroes in life, yeah. um, is very into Alexander technique. And so I've certainly, you know, listen to a lot of his speaking about mm -hmm. it and I've taken some lessons some Alexander lessons but it's not really I don't like use that language really you know so yeah. much when I teach I did one like one semester in college and I really enjoyed it and it kind of helped me with movement and somehow helped me with my performance anxiety that I had um so that's great but I also definitely identify with going to not necessarily dance school but I grew up doing um Greek folk dancing Oh my so gosh! I definitely have like that rhythm, and I definitely feel the music and feel that that has influenced how I process playing and, and music just all together. Yeah, you're lucky because um, I actually I play with a Greek guitarist named Antigone Goni. We have oh, a duo, yes, yes. and um, a, a number of years ago, this this wonderful we found this wonderful piece by a composer named Atanas Orkuzinov. Um, who, I think he's Serbian, mm. Greek, I'm not sure. Anyway, this piece, just the me the metric structure of it was just like off the map. <laughs> and Antigone, who grew up in Greece and who danced and did a lot of Greek folk dancing, was like, no, it's easy, you know, just do it this way, do it that way. It's like, you know, to just find a smooth seven as you're sailing it's along, not so you're easy lucky. To do. <laughs> but you probably got it in your bones, you know, if you yeah. move to it like that. Yeah, I think I started doing it when I was in preschool, like as soon as I could move, essentially, my it was part of sort of going to the Greek church. So yeah, those those um, complex rhythms are uh, not, they're not easy if you're not used to hearing them all the time. But yeah, it's definitely helped my playing a lot. I love it. So. Um, so other methods, do you have any um, like method books or techniques? I know you worked with Sam Barron. I think I my teacher used one of his, there was a, like a low note or 
um, like almost like a, a dynamics exercise that she had me do that was his. I have it written down somewhere, but any special techniques or books that you use with your students? Um, yeah, I'd actually be really curious to see that. If you could find it, you know, I would love to see it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the first things that I tell my students always is that, you know, I ask them, like, what's the first thing, like, when you meet a person, what's your first doorway to that person? What's the first thing you notice? What's the first thing that kind of gives you a sense of that person, you know? And um, if they give me the wrong answer, I'm like, oh, okay, well, for me, <laughs> it's the eyes. You know, when I meet a person, it's like the eye contact, you know, just going for that. And, mm -hmm. and then the second thing is just their voice, how they communicate, how they express just the, their intonation, you know. And, and so I say that basically your, the eyes are like your sound, you know, it's like nobody is going to want to be drawn in if you close your eyes when you meet them. And if you <laughs> if your sound isn't doesn't grab and connect with a person, then you've lost them. Mm -hmm. And then your voice is like your air, you know, so you've got to have just the flow, the connection. You need to be able to take a breath and know what you want to say and then put it into your put it into the flute to make that beautiful sound. So those two things together, you know, are like the sort of the, the core of what I consider to be just really the finest playing on any instrument, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love using books, methods that really um, illustrate that. So I love tone development through interpretation. Like I've given a ton of master classes using that book because mm -hmm. you can you can work on anything from, you know, breath span dynamic color, articulation, intonation, um, you know, different ways of taking a breath to either open a phrase up or lift off of it. You know, you can use it for absolutely anything to help a student or any player become greater on any level. So I love that book. And then the De La Sonorité, the Moïse De La Sonorité, yeah. again, because you know, those exercises like the pivot exercise, you know, the worst note on the flute, second octave E flat. So mm -hmm. I make, you know, I, I, the exercise I do a lot, which is taken right from Moise's book, is I, I do the pivot exercise, but I use the second octave E flat, first finger down, treat it like a harmonic, mm -hmm. and try to get like a glow, like a shrouded moon. Just get that sound, close your eyes, fill the room with that E flat, and then you move down and always and pivot back up to that note. So you're always coming back to the E flat and trying to just iron out every little bit of beautiful sound and evenness of, of interval using the worst note on the flute. You can also do it on a C sharp. Yeah. So, um, so that's my favorite exercise. That pivot exercise is my favorite. Awesome. Um mentioned playing with your eyes closed or not having a full voice what how do you approach students who you feel aren't you know have don't playing with their eyes open or with a you know a clear voice um <laughs> um i i love you know i love using the breathing bag and also the breath builder you know which mm -hmm. is the ping pong ball you blow into a tube and yeah um, because, because sometimes I've had so many students and, you know, it makes perfect sense actually that it would be this way, but, um, when they have the flute in their hands, they are thinking about so many things. They just tie themselves in knots. It's like, don't yeah. think about pink elephants, you know, um, it's really hard for them to just let go of, of, you know, making sure their hands are in the right place. They're holding the flute, right? All that stuff. Um, and so I just, I, I take them away from the instrument and I do breathing bag and breath builder with them and try to get them to watch and feel their airflow, to feel what's happening with their mouths, with their tongues, you know, inside their bodies um, without the, the impediment of a flute in their hands. And it's just truly phenomenal mm -hmm. what that does. You know, because there's nothing more natural than taking a good breath. There's nothing more natural than that feeling of 
letting your air out and on the heels of that taking it in you know the circularity of the way we breathe is what keeps our heart pumping you know um and so it's just it's like such a basic it's almost a trick it works so well and it's so basic yeah i I like that because for me, I'm very physically minded. So I have a good sense of where things are at in my body. And it took one or two lessons with a different teacher than I had in college that gave me a breathing bag. We did an exercise with that. And I all of a sudden, my sound, I was listening to lessons, uh, recordings of my lesson. And I, I did write to her. I said, I sound like I have always imagined myself sounding for the first time in, in a long time. And I just... I had other teachers tell me the same exact thing, but the presence of like a physical object or taking it away from the flute, it like, it opened it up for me immediately. So that's, yeah. that's great. You know, I mean, if you think about it, like the flute, it's just our vessel of choice for expression, mm-hmm. right? I mean, what we need to do is we need to be able to find inside of ourselves what we want to express and how we want to express it. You know, you don't need that metal vessel to do it. So if you're all knotted up about it, take it out of the picture and see if you can't just line yourself up mm-hmm. in a way that when you pick it back up, it's more, much more an extension of you, Yeah. your air and everything. All right. We'll pivot a little bit and get to some uh, questions about students and what do you do if like students don't practice? <laughs> so, um, all right. You know, I, I mean, I would say that um, because of the way that I tend to work with my students, they pretty quickly get the picture, mm-hmm. you know, that, that it's not so much fun if they don't really do their due diligence because... Yeah. I'm doing mine for every minute that I'm in a room with them or on a screen with them. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, if they don't, it's always an opportunity to kind of take it down to a basic level, either, you know, with breathing, with doing some exercises that really help um, a player just open their sound up and sound beautiful. I, or I'll make them play We'll do moise, you know, we'll do tone development through interpretation for the whole lesson and play melodies. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I will, when I, when my students don't practice, I tend to actually get even more down into the weeds with things than I would if they were presenting me with, you know, Nielsen concerto and we had to get through it and create a bigger, paint a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes it's a drag, you know, you wish they would just, put a little bit of time in because you can hear how good they would sound but you know I just try to show them how they should be doing the work at home and you know one thing I have to say that has been um, really amazing and I I hate to say anything good about this pandemic time Um, I tend to be an optimistic person and I I do feel like um, I could say a lot of good about it you know just Mm -hmm. because we're here we have to figure it out but, you know, one of the things that I, I have found to be amazing is um, that I've worked a lot with this um, platform called Soundtrap, which is basically a tracking platform. You know, it's it has a very, very simple but great editing profile to it. And basically what students do is they record themselves. They can use a click track, you know, a tuner, all that stuff. They record themselves and they sometimes are listening to another part, other times just a click track. And then they have to listen back and they have to hear, they have to listen hard to what they've done. And they are basically learning how to self-teach from a very Mm -hmm. early age. You know, I've done this with kids in seventh grade, you know, who were playing like really simple Telemann trio sonatas. Mm -hmm. And it's just phenomenal what it does, you know, that the act of, um, Recording and listening back and being your own critic is just an amazing teaching tool. Um, So, you know, I've been doing a lot of that. And like, I just actually had a student come in person to my apartment today. She's getting ready to audition for conservatories. And um, she's actually playing this beautiful, phenomenal piece by David Sanford 
called Klotka Still, which Maria Martin commissioned about, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. Great piece. Um, and so, you know, she was having problems like ending her phrases a little bit. So I have my microphone set up here. I put on GarageBand. I had her stand halfway across the room and we played, she played two different flutes and we, we basically did like a moise on it, you know, just going through phrases, how to open up a phrase, take a breath, all that recorded it she listened back and then she played it again and it honestly on both flutes it was like a different player you know she in just half an hour so that's been like a real revelation to me is the recording mm -hmm. um, so i'll do that a lot with kids who don't practice actually <laughs> i'll record them and we'll listen back together yeah great how you mentioned how you know learning flute and the teachers you had sort of informed how you got into teaching. How has being a teacher changed the way you play or has it changed the way you play and perform? Um, oh my God, that's sort of like saying, you know, how does having children change who you are? I mean, I feel like it's so, it's so innate, you know, it's like in, it, the interaction having to solve a problem together, hearing somebody play a phrase and having to really be able to understand like what is not working in this? Mm -hmm. What is it, you know? And then getting, digging down into that and figuring it out and then having figured it out for myself as well, you know? Um, it's just the exchange back and forth, you know? I love it that I, I'll sometimes go back and forth, you know, I'll play a phrase like, if somebody's doing the excerpt, you know, the on track from Carmen, they'll play and it'll be a little bit, you know, square. And then, so I'll say, well, let's just do this. You know, I'm going to play, listen to how I breathe. I'm going to take a two quarter note breath and I'm going to play. And then I play it and I say, close your eyes, just turn around, don't even watch, just listen. And then they'll play it and they'll sound better than me. And then I have to like say, well, wait a minute, I want to be able to do that. And so then I'll try it, you know, and you just bounce it back and forth, you know, and I, I think that that happens. It happens on a lot of levels. Like if you have a student who just really is not getting something like their tonguing is really hard. That's something that comes up a lot, you know, mm -hmm. that that somehow this idea that if you tongue, it means that you don't have air moving in your mouth. You have to stop the air in order to make an articulation either to start the articulation or to end it, um, you know? And so if you, that's the hardest thing to fix really. And I just find that the process of coming up with good metaphors, good analogies, good ways of trying to get them to just get over that idea that you're doing one thing or the other, um, it's just such a learning process for me. It's amazing, you know? Yeah. It's definitely made me a, a, a better critical thinker when I have to practice things. So, oh, definitely. But yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you just uh, summed it up. You become a very good critical thinker. Yeah. Well, and it's like about it's about problem solving. So, yes. um, yeah, it makes me a better practicer. I feel like when I'm working on things. Um, all right. So, for aspiring teachers out there, kind of a last question: Do you have any words of wisdom for? people who are currently teaching or people who are, you know, maybe about to step into a lifetime of playing and teaching? Well, I think you have to be kind. You have to be humble. You have to take each person, just like each piece of music, you have to take each person as they come. You know, you cannot have a method of teaching because um, people are as different as tones and flutes and anything else and you have to just really want to partner with that person and take that journey mm -hmm. you know you have to have like an open-heartedness and a willingness and a very constantly creative way of engaging and articulating um, your thoughts and you have to have a lot of respect for the, the people that you're working with. Because, you know, maybe they don't sound so great right now, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean anything. You know, they, they could become amazing players. They could be just 
brilliant mathematicians or, you know, they could invent the next electric car you know you just don't, i mean just to have an open mind and an open heart about everybody who you're engaging with it's great thank you well thank you so much for taking time to talk with me today i really appreciate it thanks for tuning in if you want to learn more about our guests there's more information below if you're a teacher make sure to sign up for club fcny to unlock free shipping extended trials and commission for teachers as well as other exclusive benefits for you and your students as always remember to like comment and subscribe